We're going to go into our closing session. Arbor Berkowitz, who's a, a member of a, a loyal member of the executive committee of Cambridge Residence Alliance and a, an educator, and a, now actually in a PhD program on public policy at UMass Boston. So, Arbor, take it away for the closing session. Sure. Um, thanks so much to everyone who has come today and spoken um, and also asked questions, provided feedback. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with Drew that we're kind of building a really powerful movement um, and a powerful movement that hears from lots of different folks in our city. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited. Um, in this session, you'll be hearing from Mike Nakagawa, Reverend Vernon K. Walker, and Councilor Dennis Colon. I'm gonna just read your intros. Mike Nakagawa has lived in Alewife area of North Cambridge uh, for over a quarter century using his engineering experience to support environmental initiatives in various ways, including participating in several Cambridge City Working Groups on climate change resiliency. Mike is also on the leadership teams of a few neighborhood groups. Our Reverend Vernon K. Walker is a new Cambridge resident, welcome, and the current senior program manager at the Communities Responding to Extreme Weather, or CRU, which is based in Cambridge. CRU is a program that prepares people for extreme weather, such as heat waves, floods, et cetera, across Massachusetts. And finally, Councillor Dennis Carlone, currently serving his third term on the Cambridge City Council, where he's earned recognition as an advocate for social justice through his expertise in citywide planning, transit policy, and sustainability initiatives. In addition to serving on the council, Dennis has worked as a planner, architect, and urban design consultant since 1970. So um, first we're gonna hear from Mike Nakagawa. So Mike, take it away. So I'll, I'll start sharing in a little bit, but just starting out, um, just wanted to mention that I, I initially was a little uncomfortable speaking um, to what I wanted to be the focus um, of my topic, because although I am a person of color with Latino heritage, I recognize I do have a fair degree of privilege now, such as having the time and resources to attend a two hour meeting about parks. Think about that. But um, I am pushing past my discomfort of wondering if I'm properly representing those um, who may not have the time, education, or understanding of the city power system because I have heard from people thanking me for being a voice for them. So perhaps I'm kind of on the right side of things. But one concern I have is that the city, as the city gets more developed, we lose um, on site spaces, uh, on site open spaces, and instead create and enhance parks. We're losing trees at a rate that 10 years from now will have half the shading we had 10 years ago, which is the goal of the urban forest master plan to get back to that level. And unless we slow down the rate of mature tree loss, we're, we'll need to plant 4,000 trees per year, every year for the next 50 years, just to get to where we were 10 years ago. When we're losing trees because we're putting buildings in their place spaces, um, where are we gonna put those 200,000 new trees? Parks, right? Well, um, let me start sharing. Um, so I have been part of the Milwaukee Forest Planning uh, process. And today I was at Danny Park where 1400 plantings were put on the side of the sledding hill and you can see it was all dirt. And now um, at the end of the day, it was, they were almost done uh, and I had to leave to come to this meeting. Um, and um, the process is a fast growing planting technique with 40 mostly native species trying to simulate how old growth forests start which has resulted in healthier trees than usual mono, urban monocultures. So uh, I encourage you to look that up. But really parks are designed for the privileged generally. They are a destination, a destination that people with extra time and resources go to. Now, if you find an extra 15 minutes of free time in your day and want to read a book to your kid or probably grandkid given the usual demographics of the people who attend this sort of a forum, maybe you can go in your backyard and sit under a tree. But if you don't have a tree available and it takes five minutes just to get to the park and five minutes to get back, no book under a tree. And if you're fortunate enough to be someone who has several free hours um, in your week, you can get to various parks. Another issue is that even if your local park is close enough to get to, it's probably not safe for smaller kids to get there on their own. That's why we need open spaces just outside the doors where people live first and foremost. Then we need to um, ways for people to safely get to the nearby parks. Um, so just across from the tracks from Danny Park, there's Danny Park, there's a commuter rail 
tracks. Um, this is a census block with the most affordable housing units in the city. It's two and a half times the number of the next highest area. And that's before the additional 100 units planned um, for the tower closest to the parkway and 150 more units in Jefferson Park. Um, and their modernization, Jefferson Park, we're losing 144 of their 200 mature trees in that process. But if you lived in one of these apartments, there's no safe, easy way to get to Danahy Park. Um, so here's a, this is the view um, of Danahy from a friend of mine's unit. Um, you can, so close, right? Just right over there past this other building. Um, to get there, people need to walk out onto Ringe Ave, then down to the parkway, over a tall bridge, down a hill, dirt path, go off this several foot retaining wall, and then cross the parking lot to get to Danny Park. And this, this steps is, is new um, until someone recently put these in on top of this dirt mound. Uh, but until a few weeks ago, you descended onto a tipped over shopping cart. It has been that way for the 30 years since Danahy Park was created. 30 years. If you live there and have a small kid and free hour to look at the new forest we planted today over in this area of Danahy, you could get there, wave at the forest and head back. That's how much time you have. So um, we need to do better than that. Um, one idea I've had is to have a tunnel connecting underneath uh, the commuter rail tracks to connect Dan Jefferson Park here with Danahy Park next to this, the dog park. It's all publicly owned land, so no private ownership concerns, that, and that would allow neighbors access to the park. And with the help of City Councilor Patty Nolan and Mayor Sumpel Siddiqui, we're finally getting through to have discussion with some of the uh, city players, uh, getting them talking. Um, then there's Russell Field over here across from Rinjav from the apartments. But Rinjav is often congested and there aren't good, safe, convenient crossing points. Um, so an underpass and better crossings at Rinjav would connect Danahy and Russell Field playing fields in a way that kids could bike between safely. Um, one crossing, minute. Okay, and crossing um, Danahy, there's only uh, one block of quiet street to get to um, uh, the Tobin Vaseline School rather than going down the Rinjav for a long way. And there's also affordable housing uh, down here at Bristol Arms. They could get the OF team and Man Trail and Russell Field and the OF Brook Reservation. The reservation is gr a great large urban wild, but it's at the far edge of town limiting who can easily use it to basically people um, who have the luxury of time. So in closing, we need to think about how to give um, equal access to green spaces um, and facilitate the access. Parks are great, but not if you can't get to them. So thank you for giving me the time. Thank you so much, Mike. All right. Um, okay, so next we're gonna hear from Reverend Vernon K. Walker, um, who is speaking on behalf of CREW, I believe. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, uh, wherever you may be, uh, uh, we greet you. Uh, we humbly greet you. Uh, so good to be so, with so many of you today. Uh, we've heard outstanding panels uh, prior to this section, uh, really informative, uh, really learned a lot. Uh, quickly and briefly, uh, we will just talk about uh, CREW here. Uh, CREW is uh, an acronym for Communities Responding to Extreme Weather. Uh, and what we do folks is we help uh, prepare people in an equitable, sustainable and inclusive manner uh, to become climate resilient. Uh, when we think of climate change, we should, you know, a lot of people think about, you know, hotter, long, hotter longer summers, hotter summers, and intensive uh, winter weather, uh, winter storms. But also, climate change is, is, is also manifests itself in places like Texas, where the snow happened. Uh, and unfortunately, over 20 people have uh, experienced the death uh, uh, this past winter in Texas because snow happened. Uh, so certainly uh, when we think of climate change, I like to kind of think of it as uh, climate chaos. Um, and uh, simply put, we know that the last 150 years, uh, 
extreme weather has been happening and the burning and the and because that's that's right around the time of the burning of fossil fuels that's when we notice that the global temperature is starting to warm up and the, the greenhouse gases uh starting to in the greenhouse gas effect starting to take place uh, so we know folks that the next uh decade and a half we know that we will be dealing with extreme weather let me share my screen really quickly uh and as i as i'm pulling up my screen here uh, also i just want to thank the folks who are organizing this and perhaps this should have been done in the preamble but uh i want to just thank you all uh for organizing this and hopefully we can uh provide steps for, for going forward. Uh, so again, uh, this is Crew. I'm just gonna show y'all a few things. Um, Crew is part of the Better Future Project. I, I, I didn't name that, but the Better Future Project works to build an equitable, uh, a powerful grassroots meant to address the climate crisis and advance a rapid and responsible transition beyond coal, oil, gas towards renewable energy for us all. We have three programs, 350 Mass, Divest, Ed, and Crew. Um, I'm going to focus particularly on Crew. Crew is a young grassroots organization that aims to build equitable, inclusive neighborhood climate resilience in New England through hands on education, service, and planning. What that looks like uh, is we do a lot of workshops that we're actually in the midst of our climate prep week. Uh, and I can show that in just a second. Um, and we we hold workshops all year round where we talk about the connection between extreme weather and climate change uh, and what people can do to prepare. Uh, like one of the things that we do and that we've done this summer is we've given out air conditioner units to low income residents in Brockton. Um, we were in the Boston Globe uh, in uh, I think uh, August 29th was the date for the online paper. Uh, and we had workshops in Dorchester's, uh, and we also given out uh, AC units, uh, which we also continue to do. Uh, we, we also did last summer as well. Um, and, and just to this real quick, uh, weather fatalities, uh, we can see here, let me just move this out of the way. So we can see that extreme weather kills people. Uh, so for the last 30 year average, you see that heat uh, the, according to the National Weather Service, heat is the, the, has killed the most people per year. 138 people across the United States per year has happened uh, because of heat. We see hurricanes, tornadoes, lightning, floods, cold, wind, rip current. So we know that uh, extreme weather is deadly and disastrous. Um, so what can we expect to see here in New England? Uh, you know, on average from 1971 to 2000, there was 11 hot days, uh, temperatures over 90 degrees. And uh, in the current epochs that we live in, in the time frame that we are, uh, 2015, 2044, we're expected to see up if the tipping points are right. And if it gets to the worst of the worst, we'll see up to 30 days of uh, of the temperature over 90 degrees in 2055 to 2084. Uh, at the extreme point, we'll experience 60 days of temperature over 90 degrees. And we understand that heat is deadly, heat is dangerous, causes heat exhaustion, uh, heat stroke, et cetera, and it, it can exacerbate certain pre existing conditions. So we understand that heat is deadly and dangerous. Um, so um, let's talk about one minute story. left. Sorry. We got one minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, really quickly, um, the stormwater runoff. Uh, this is Cambridge Central Square, Kendall Square, uh, and this is we're expected to see extensive flooding uh, by 2070. Uh, and that map that I showed y'all about the heat, that's for the greater Boston area. Uh, but there's things we can do. We, we, we help people we, we help people do uh, kits. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, uh, we help people do kits because we know that there is a, like a, a heat kits and winter kits. And we know that there is an intersection between uh, having more trees and also uh, uh, climate change because if uh, uh, the tree in the neighborhood can make a, a, um, a eighty degree a ninety degree day feel like eighty degrees, and a eighty degree day feel like ninety degrees if you're in the concrete jungle. So we know the importance of trees. Thank you all who was out there earlier, uh, and maybe a little later I get a chance to uh, you know, talk about climate prep week at our website. Uh, www.climatecrew.org uh, cli uh, um, on September 28th, two uh, next week, we have an event with Why Trees Matter. Uh, we have someone from Parks and Recreation, uh, Maggie Owens. We have Molly H Henry from the uh, American Forest, and we have Davies Meshalom, uh, the founder of Speak for the Trees. Uh, so that's on our website. So I'm going to put a pin right there. Um, 
And, you know, because we can talk on and on, but I want to be respectful of the time and stay within the time constraints. So I'm going to hand it back off to the moderator and I hope I'm within my time constraints. That was great. Thank you so much, Reverend Walker. Um, and if you don't mind putting that link in the chat, I'm sure lots of folks would love to click on it. So. Oh, yes, I'll do that now. Perfect. Thank you so much. OK, and um, our last panelist for the day is uh, Cambridge City Councilor Dennis Carlone. Take it away, Dennis. Thank you, Abra. Um, I've been asked to sort of pull it all together and talk about next steps. And I'm encouraged so much by this group, um, a lot of heroes in this group. Um, there were some high points that I wanted to mention that uh, Jonathan talked about opening schools. I had a school that was open um, in the evenings and it did make all the difference. It's where all the kids hung out to be very honest, and uh, playing sports or social events. Kate Frank talked about the difficulty of prioritizing one thing, affordable housing, and defaming another thing, open space, and vice versa, is totally counterproductive, and I agree. And you know, when you do a master plan, which the city, I was the guy that sponsored the Envision plan, it didn't turn out as requested. You, you look at everything not as yes and no, is how do you make them both work? How do you make all the needs work? And you need a strategy for that. And the city has not done that. And I think the open space study that they've started is trying to fill that void in. Shelley talked about how are we doing? And here's the kicker about that, Shelley. City employees are not evaluated. There is no what was successful, what wasn't. Uh, now, maybe at the highest level there is in each department, but not employees. And I know they intrinsically know what parks are succeeding and which ones aren't, but we've never seen anything like that. And I totally agree that makes sense. Mike Nakagawa should be frustrated. Here's the truth. If you look at, and it's been mentioned by a few people without the statistic, we're the fourth densest city in the country, over 100,000 population. So yes, there's Chelsea and Somerville that are denser. We have 51% of the open space of the average city per capita. We have half. A lot of it is in one part of the city. The rest is not. The connections are missing. So what's, what do we need to succeed on an open space? You've all brought it up. Access, easy, safe access. And where we don't have it, we have to locate a new open space. Overview. In certain neighborhoods, you need front doors overviewing a park to see what's going on informally. It's public view. You need the right design, you need green, and you need programming. How is that park going to be used? So we have some built-in amenities. The state park system that was mentioned, Magazine Beach is a shining example of working together. Well, we have Harvard in front of a large amount of that. We have uh, hospitals, we have MIT. Do you know how much the boathouses of each institution paid for the right to use that boathouse every year? One dollar. The state could have easily said, you're maintaining any frontage you have, and you're going to plant it correctly according to the master plan. That didn't happen. That was before Big Mike got on the state legislature. So a couple of things. When I worked on the East Cambridge Riverfront plan, the neighborhood asked for more open space. 30% of the 40 acres that was slated for development is open space. The canal, triangular park, front park. The quadrangle in, East, in, in West Cambridge. Do you know that the water department counts the number of people walking around Fresh Pond every day? and they don't want to go over 1500 because it will pack the land and people will go into the woods 
and will hurt the water supply. So Fresh Pond is not Central Park, like where I grew up. It's not. It's a, very, it's a reservoir. It's very different. That's our major park. Um, Chris Casa, God bless his soul. He showed an Olmsted, Olmsted, and Elliot plan of Memorial Drive. If you looked at East Cambridge, where Hotel Sinesta is, down to the Land Institute, Longfellow Bridge, that was all bought as open space, planned by Olmsted, including a beach. It was never built. It became the Victory Gardens in World War II, publicly owned and sold in the late 40s, early 50s for industrial development, $3 a foot. If you know the new Cambridge Street School, uh, the new school on Cambridge Street, wonderful complex, nice backyard with fields, the best softball fields I never played on. Um, one minute. I can't summarize in one minute, but I'll tell you that was an Olmsted Park, the whole thing, with the skating pond, the most beautiful skating pond imaginable. So if you want more open space, we have to organize and make it a goal of the council. Council goals get financed and then push for it. One neighborhood, the port, has 20% of the national average of open space. It's all in our hands, folks. I have much more to say, but at another time. Great, thank you so much, Council Carlo. Um, so I know, Jonathan, we're getting close to time, but I, it would be great to take a couple of questions. So, um, so let's go to James, because I know James has his hand up, and um, then Suzanne, or maybe that's just an applause that Suzanne has, um, and we'll take it from there. So James? Williamson. Okay. I'm free to unmute myself. It's not like a city council meeting. Um, so I live, if you look at the image of Mike Nakagawa and you look over the, his left eye, you'll see a large apartment building that is adjacent to the <laughs> North Cambridge Catholic Cemetery. That's where I live. And I'm sitting there now and I look out my back window and I see a nice big green space. It's called the cemetery. And for the last year and a half, People have been um, walking in that cemetery, strolling in it, um, riding their bikes, doing all kinds of things there. It's a nice big open space. The priority for me living here for almost 15 years and having been president of the tenant council, which I jump started when I after I first moved here because there was none, isn't um, uh, some kind of a walkway over to Danny He Field. It is the fact that the housing authority are planning to destroy the 11 buildings that exist here to put up new buildings that among other things where the site plan is going to put a, a street behind where I live now that would interfere with the relationship that is we enjoy that connects us with that green space in the cemetery. Hardly anybody in the city has, has, has shown any interest in, in what's happening here. The total per unit cost anticipated for their plans for Jefferson Park is $908,000 per unit. That ought to be disgraceful to anybody who lives in this city and cares about affordable housing. I don't wanna go, I could go on, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. I have tried to get in touch with Dennis Carlone and he's never gotten back to me. I have tried to get in touch with other city councilors. I have sent emails to all sorts of people in this city. Just about the only person I've developed any sort of rapport with, in addition to Mike Nakagawa, who consistently cares about what's happening here, is Eric Grunebaum. So I'm gonna put my email in the chat. If anybody wants to hear about what it's like living here and what the perspective of people who actually live in Jefferson Park and in public housing, you're welcome to get in touch with me and thank you. Uh, thank you so much, James. I really appreciate it. Um, I just think... want to uh, point out, um, since he did mention it, and thanks, James, for your kind words, but um, Jefferson Park is behind me on, over the one shoulder. It's in, split in two parts, and they re recently did 
one section and you can see in their modernization they got rid of like 95 percent of the trees on the property and you can can't see where they are and you can see they're about to get rid of three quarters of the ones um, are on the other side where you can see those big trees that are taller than the buildings and it looked like they did the standard process of doing a plan on looking at the site outline and then they plop down their plan on top of the existing site and said oh there's some trees there we can cut those down so it's we need to change the way we think about planning and it's the same thing that happened at the Tobin school where no one found out about the trees that were going to be cut down until the week they before they submitted their plan for approvals and everyone's like oh that green space where the big trees are is not green because you're saving the trees it would just happen to be a green area that they're leaving but they were cutting down one of the largest trees in the, the city oh, well, how, how do you look at that so sorry thanks mike uh, all right by, by um, the way it's all, it's up over 150 trees now they keep changing their plans they're up over 150 out of 204 um we're at time we we're gonna we've just had heard mentioned some of the sharpest problems uh that we face uh, let me say in this forum you're all aware we started off with the charles river and we gave a lot of emphasis what's going on in the charles river and then some of the citywide issues with young people but we certainly gave short shrift to fresh pond Isle wife brook area uh and james's and the and the housing up there there's no doubt that that's among the most intense, um, you know, open space and um, climate resilient problems the city faces. And of course, East Cambridge, we gave some short shrift to. You know, this is the beginning of um, trying to broaden the base of, of these issues. We'll have another such forum uh, in the late winter, early spring. You'll all hear about it. We'll try to pick up on some of these issues. And as Dennis has called for, Quentin, try to develop a kind of um, political uh, force around these things. It's not that there haven't been political fights around the trees and around turf versus grass, but we really haven't had a coherent, uh, you know, citywide group that's explicitly political. It's not 501c3, not trying to get grants, but, but able to get down and dirty. So. You know, I, I hope this will, will keep going on, on these issues. I want to thank all of you uh, for participating, all of you for listening and questioning, and we will get back to you and try to keep you upgraded. And of course, we have these great groups like Green Cambridge, uh, like the Memorial Drive Alliance, like the Charles River Watershed Association. Make mm -hmm. sure you join, right? And, uh, and keep yourself posted. So with that, um, I would like to declare us adjourned uh, and uh, wish you all a good weekend.